Get rolling here with week number seven in the course. Last week of the introduction to quantitative geology course. So I suppose uh, maybe that's exciting on some on some level. But uh, we basically are going to continue with what we were doing last week in terms of the theme of this week's exercise. And there's actually not any significant amount of new material that I'll introduce in this week's um, lecture time at all. So it will be only material that we have covered previously in the uh, in the previous weeks up to this point in the course. But of, of course, we'll have opportunity to address any questions you might have, and I will go over in general um, what this week's exercise is is about and how things are going to work for the end of the course in our remaining bit of time. So uh, yeah, I think just taking a quick look at the feedback that's been posted here on our poll page, it looks like exercises were, were fairly good to difficult, but straightforward and not too long and challenging enough. So that all sounds pretty good to me. I think this was the kind of idea that I was hoping to um, to see be the case for this last um, last like two exercises in the course is that we put together things that we have been working on a bit on and off in different uh, in different weeks and. The idea with that is that we can essentially combine all of the main topics we've addressed in the course earlier on, things like heat transfer, predicting thermal chronometer ages, and all of that stuff, and in the end come away with um, a nice little thermal chronology model that does basically everything you would need to do to start interpreting some of this data yourself. And uh, we've done most of that work in exercise number six. Of course, we had done things in earlier weeks, but we've done most of the work putting together this model in exercise number six, and we'll continue with a few things in exercise seven and then apply the model to um, interpret some, some thermal chronometer data. But I wanted to maybe start just by checking with you all. Are there any questions or anything at this point about exercise six? or things from week six, um, I'll just remind you that exercise six is due on Friday this week. I can't remember, what did I end up saying? Friday by five o'clock? Yeah, so 5 p.m. on Friday this week is when exercise six is due. That's of course because I was late in getting it posted. So my apologies for, uh, for the delay there. It took far longer than I anticipated to rework an earlier exercise into the new format. And uh, similarly, this week I'm running a bit behind on exercise seven, but I should have that up more quickly because um, I have a pretty good uh, amount of the exercise already done, but of course I need to test things before I turn it loose to you all. So that'll be a slight delay on exercise seven being available, but we'll go over what the idea is with exercise seven um, in, in the course time we have today. But at this point, yeah, do you have any questions from, from exercise six? Um, you can, of course, ask questions at this stage and, and actually use the answers to, um, to work on exercise six since it's not yet due. So yeah, any questions? Seems like maybe not. I guess that's perhaps a good thing. Um, I felt like overall exercise six, as described here, was fairly straightforward. There was a couple places in there where it got pretty heavy. Uh, so a couple of the functions you had to create were a bit involved. So if I just take a look here at the exercise six uh, template repository, uh, point out a couple things. One is, in case you haven't noticed, GitHub has changed the way in which notebooks are now rendered, so they look slightly different than they did before. I think in in almost all ways, this is an improvement. 
um, but just in case things look a little different than they did earlier, that's that's the reason why. But the nice thing now is that equations are properly rendered in GitHub, so um, that's handy for when we look over exercises and when you kind of look through yours. If you don't want to launch the notebooks uh, system from the CSC, you could just have a quick look at your repository to to see things there. But yeah, you had things like in this part two. I think this is is probably the biggest challenge, uh, if I remember correctly, part two and part three, you had some some significant work to do there to uh, take what we had earlier, which was like our Dodson's method for calculating a predicted thermal chronometer age and to link that to a to a thermal history that now has a cooling rate that changes over time. So. Uh, because the rocks are cooling from some depth up toward the surface, and this is not a straight line in terms of the variation in temperature with depth, the cooling rate is going to be changing over time, and that's the thing you had to deal with here that made this uh, a little bit more tricky in part two of this exercise. That was to get you some closure temperatures. Once you had the closure temperatures, Calculating the thermal chronometer ages was relatively straightforward, although there were a few new functions introduced like np.interp and np.flip. So these are some NumPy functions that we could have probably coded up these things ourselves, but let's be resourceful and use existing uh, functions where we can. NumPy has these things for doing interpolation so that we don't have to worry about ourselves coming up with some kind of of uh, our kind of homemade solution for a problem that's already been well addressed by the developers of the NumPy package. So um, yeah, I hope that these new functions weren't too difficult to use. np.flip, I suppose, is a fairly straightforward one. And the np.interp, if you went and checked out the documentation on the NumPy website, you would see that we used a sort of relatively uh, simple set of things here. So there's three required parameters, and uh, those were the three things you passed in. Then there were some optional things that we didn't use. Um, this type of interpolation, I think, is is fairly simple in a way. It's just a linear interpolation, and if you want, there are other methods available, like from the SciPy package. There's a SciPy interpolate uh, that you can use that does, I think, slightly more sophisticated things or has some different variable like options for doing interpolations that are more sophisticated in a way. So fitting things to a spline and other stuff like that that we're not going to worry about right now. But um, but hopefully you found those functions relatively easy to understand what they were doing. And in essence, our main idea was once we have our cooling history, we have these sort of temperatures at different points. And if we want to find out at what time we pass through the closure temperature, most likely we're not going to be so lucky as to have our closure temperature be exactly the temperature at one of those points in the thermal history. So then we need to use an interpolation uh, to find a temperature between two points. So we have two times that we know and two temperatures for those times and our closure temperature most likely is somewhere in between the two and we can use this interp method from the NumPy package to find that temperature in between two known values. And it's done, I think, fairly simply in this uh, in this case. Um, so yeah, I think that was the kind of basic idea for exercise six. If you don't have any questions at this point, uh, that's fine. But we can maybe talk then a little bit about what's coming up. So uh, I think on the course page, you should hopefully see that Lesson 7's overview is visible. And if you go there, what you'll see is basically a list of mostly stuff from, from uh, week number six. So these are the slides that we had on low temperature thermochronology last week and the introduction to exercises six and seven. So those are linked here just for your convenience as well as the final paper description. We went through the final paper uh, a bit last week and you can also find the information here on the course page that describes what you should do there and uh, if we have any questions about that maybe at the end of our discussion here uh, you'd be more than welcome to ask questions about the final final paper um, 
Ooh, I didn't post the lesson video yet, so I still need to do that. Um, whoops. And uh, I can try to get that up as soon as this evening. But um, but yeah, exercise seven's not quite ready yet. And basically, if I go back to exercise six here, and we think about what we did in exercise number six, I guess if I scroll way up to the top, um, in this first problem, we did a bunch of stuff here about predicting thermal chronometer ages from a thermal model. So we created this thermal history. We used this uh, transient heat transfer equation to give us a thermal history. This would be just a history that would be recorded in a rock as it's cooling on its way up to the surface. So we recorded that thermal history and used it to then calculate what the closure temperature would be for different thermal chronometers using Dodson's method. So again, the challenge here was the fact that this cooling rate would be changing over time because the most likely uh, in a sort of erosional environment, you're going to see faster and faster cooling rates as you get closer to the surface. And what we want to do is use the correct cooling rate at the time when our rock sample passes through its closure temperature. So that's what we did in the second point. Then once we had a closure temperature, it was fairly easy to find a thermochronometer age. We kind of just went through that. Uh, what we didn't do is step four, where we read in some measured age data. So we're going to do that in exercise number six. And we also did not calculate a goodness of fit for each thermal chronometer system. So that's also something we're going to do uh, in exercise seven this week. Uh, maybe I said exercise six by mistake for the previous point. But yes, exercise seven for both of those. Then we... Um, we did calculate temperatures, but we didn't do any plotting. And uh, so this point actually should be in italics because we didn't cover this. Uh, but this will also be something we do in exercise number seven. Uh, so we'll calculate some temperatures for the crust at the start and end of the thermal model so that we can see what the, what the geotherms looked like at those two times. And then we'll plot the results. So there's a few things left over here. Reading in the age data, that's gonna be pretty easy. We've done this kind of stuff previously, and uh, we're going to use pandas and read it in. That won't be a big deal. Calculating the goodness of fit. Well, we already have this chi-squared function from back in week two that we could use to calculate the goodness of fit. So that's not too bad in terms of, like, we don't have to create a function for that. But there will be some, um, some challenges that still exist there. So that's uh, something that you'll, you'll deal with. But basically, we're going to take our predicted age and see how well it fits the measured ages from this data file. And, um, and then once we've done that, we're going to make some plots. And we'll, I think for each one of these kind of models, I would foresee making two different plots. One would be kind of a temperature field plot that shows the kind of starting and ending temperatures. Uh, and then we could also include our thermal history in that plot so you can see kind of visually how your rock sample has cooled on its way up to the surface. This is something we didn't get to really see last week, so it may help you in understanding the thermal history to see it on the plot. So we'll do that. And uh, the other plot we'll make is we'll plot the age data that we have along with the predicted ages, and we can put then in text our goodness of fit values on the plot so we can see what the measured age data set looks like, what our predicted age looks like in comparison to that, and then also kind of a quantitative aspect, this number that tells us how well our predicted age from our thermal chronometer model fits the observed ages or the measured ages in this data file. So we'll have those two, two plots, and essentially you'll do this in problem one of this week's exercise that you'll do the reading in the data, calculating the goodness of fit and making some plots. And then we're gonna stick all that stuff into one big function. So the things that we did last week, plus these extra steps, we'll put them into one big function so that you can basically just call this function with a given exhumation rate and a or advection velocity and a couple other parameters, and it will do all of these steps in a single function call, which will make it very nice to do our comparison to try to find a good fit to the observed or measured age data in the data file. So you could imagine you might want to call this function a bunch of times to try to test out different 
uh, advection velocities and see how that changes the goodness of fit to the measured age data. And so that, by making it into a single function, will make life a little bit easier that way. And our function can do everything, like if we can just put the plotting inside the function and, and all of that so that you just call the function and it basically does everything you need to do in a single call. That won't be too difficult, I don't think. I, I suspect what you're going to do in in this situation is basically copy paste stuff from exercise six and from exercise seven into this function. M you know, make a couple minor edits and you'll be good to go with that. So that's the first problem. In problem two, essentially your task is going to be to try to find what advection velocity gives the best fit to the age data that we have. So when we looked last week at our preview for exercise six and seven, I think that's, uh, maybe pull up the slides here quickly in a kind of PDF preview. Not found, oops, why is that not found? That's interesting. Uh, okay. Well, those slides should be there. Sorry, I thought the link should have been working. Let's see if they work from here. Nope, they sure don't. All right, well, things are off to a good start so far. Let me see if I can open up our introduction slides. I think it was maybe this set here. Uh, and I'll fix the the link that we had. So it was mentioned that we're going to be looking at some age data from the Himalaya and Bhutan. And then we saw this kind of map view of where these samples had been collected across this transect in Western Bhutan. So kind of running north to south, uh, there were a bunch of different rock samples that were collected and different thermal chronometer methods were used to date those rock samples. And the resulting age data set looks something like this. So we'll be plotting our ages in the same style that we'll have age on the vertical axis here and latitude along the X axis. But you can see there's some age variation in there. And so we're gonna be calculating a single predicted age which we'll plot as a line on a plot that looks something like this. We won't have this uh, elevation swath in there, but just a single line for a given predicted age for one of the different thermal chronometers. And then you can add as text the goodness of fit for that thermal chronometer. And the idea would be that as you will see, and probably as you already know, if you use a very slow advection velocity, you get very old thermal chronometer ages. And if you make the advection velocity faster and faster, the ages get younger. But of course, if the ages get too young, you know, if you get ages in this case of around 1 million years or something like that, um, you know, those ages would all be younger than the observed or measured thermal chronometer ages. And of course, your goodness of fit would be then getting worse if your ages get too young. So if they're too old, you'll have a bad goodness of fit. And if you speed up your advection velocity, what you should see is your predicted ages get younger and younger until the point that they kind of have this best fit um, at a given advection velocity. And if you keep increasing the velocity, you'll see that the, the fit, fit gets worse and worse for higher velocities because the ages continue to get younger and younger and at some point it's simply too young to fit the um, to fit the age data that we have and uh, so I'm going to ignore my phone um, yeah I think that's the kind of idea here so in order to do this kind of comparison that we want to do to try to find out what advection velocity gives us the best fit to our age data, because that would tell us, for instance, what the age data record in terms of how fast the, uh, the rocks near the surface have been eroding over time. So um, in that situation, we're then uh, going to play around with the advection velocities, try to find a good fit to the different age data sets. And what you might see is that for different thermal chronometers, you have a different best fit velocity, which might tell you something about how the rates of erosion in 
this part of the Himalaya have changed over time, whether they've been faster or slower at different times in the past. And, uh, and we'll get something then of kind of a history of erosion in this, uh, in this exercise using our age data and our thermal chronometer model. And that should give you then everything you need to work on the final project report, because essentially in that final paper, uh, what you're asked to do is essentially talk about these last two exercises, six and seven, in the context of what it tells you about how fast the Himalaya in Bhutan have been eroding over time and some of the different things that might be affecting that erosion or some of the limitations of your model and things like that. You have opportunities to talk about a range of different things here in the final report. So, yeah, I think at this point, I maybe could ask, are there any questions about exercise seven kind of in terms of its plan? I don't have it up yet, obviously, so I can't show you any details, but I think I've gone over basically what, what it would do, and you can hopefully see how that's a continuation from exercise number six. Uh, any questions about exercise seven, week seven stuff, or or the final paper? It's a quiet group today, but that's okay. Um, I mean, if there aren't any questions, that's kind of all that I had prepared for today. So um, if you finished exercise six, that's great. I guess you'll just have to unfortunately wait for exercise seven. If you're still working on exercise six, I can sort of uh, stay here in in Zoom for the time that, you know, if anyone is interested in having some uh, questions about exercise six addressed or whatever, I can stay here. Um, but otherwise, I will try to get exercise seven posted as soon as possible so you can get started on that. The tentative deadline for exercise number seven is the 22nd of December. That's Wednesday. So that's a week from Wednesday, this, this coming Wednesday. Um, so I think what that would mean is basically you should have uh, at least a week to finish exercise number seven and then you would have that done before the Christmas break so hopefully then you can have that like kind of put out of your mind um, if you want you know of course it'd be great if you can get the the final paper done before that but the final paper itself is not due until I think what is it 14th of 14th of January, yeah. So that's gonna be the Friday of the second week in January. So that's right before the teaching period number three starts. And uh, so you should have time if you don't get into the final paper before the holiday break, you'll have time then before the next teaching period starts to, to make some progress there. But yeah, uh, I don't have anything else to share with you for today. We covered all our introductory stuff that we needed um, in in last week's lecture. And I'll just maybe remind you that, you know, when it comes to working on this final report and even on, on exercises six and seven, don't forget to go back and look through some of these materials we've covered in the earlier lessons. I mean, if you have questions about goodness of fit, you can go back to when we talked about goodness of fit in lesson two. Or if it's things about the basic ideas of thermal chronology, well, we covered some of that in, in exercise or in lesson number three. And same thing with uh, the heat transfer and advection ideas. Those were covered in lesson number four in, uh, in some capacity in both of these uh, sets of lecture slides. Lesson five is sort of anomaly in the sense that we didn't take too much from that to use in the weeks uh, six and seven, but otherwise we're pull pulling stuff from weeks one through four and uh, and week six now into what we do in, in week number seven. So we'll have stuff from the earlier lessons and just don't forget to go if you're kind of confused about something back into these earlier lesson materials and have a look there 
and uh, otherwise you're also welcome to ask questions on Slack. But that's it for me otherwise today. I, as mentioned, I'll just stay here on Zoom if you have any questions about exercise six, and um, otherwise I will get exercise seven up and available to you as soon as I, as soon as I can. Okay, so yeah, any last questions at this point? I'm gonna go with probably not. All right, well, if that's the case, then I will shut down the recording at this point. And like I said, I'll stay here until everybody disappears. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to stick around and ask them. Otherwise, good luck, and uh, we'll catch you on Friday in in the exercise session. And uh, since it is the last lecture today, I'll also say that uh, I hope you enjoyed the course. I hope you feel like you've learned a few things. I'm fairly pleased with, uh, with what we covered in terms of content and topics this year. I like the way that this uh, has gone overall. There have been some kind of bumps in the road with transitioning to using this intro QG functions uh, script file, but I think it ends up that this is kind of a useful resource at this point that if you need to do any of these kind of calculations in the future, you have a set of functions that are right there ready for you to use in, uh, in your little personal Python library. So, um, you know, I think there's still some room to develop things a bit further, but I hope overall that, uh, that you found the course enjoyable and hopefully learned a thing or two about how to use Python to investigate uh, geological problems. So, yeah, if I don't catch you uh, otherwise before the holiday break, enjoy the time off, and uh, I'll try to drop in on Friday to the to the exercise session. So if you're there, I'll hopefully see you there.